Thank you. I want to thank Reverend Brad uh, for making it possible for me to preach this Sunday and thank Grace, our liturgist. I, had, I was telling Grace I had a dream last night that I was bumbling through the liturgy and she had to keep standing up and saying, no, you, you do this next, see, which is kind of coming true. Uh, <laughs> and I want to thank Paul Breckis up uh, in the balcony there. He is recording this for posterity and for the Board of Ordained Ministry. Um, well, it's good to be with you all and good to be among family. Um, some time ago, I was trying to replace the faucet on our kitchen sink, and I asked my wife, Sandra, to go downstairs to the main water shut off and turn off the water. And then at critical moments of my repair effort, I would holler down the stairs and say, okay, shut her down, shut, shut it off, on, off. Um, well, I, I learned some valuable lessons through that experience. I learned, first of all, that I really did need all those little parts and could not simply ignore some of them uh, because the water sprayed out when I didn't use them all. And I also learned that there's a little knob under the sink where you can turn the water on and off without yelling down the stairs, which is a lot more convenient. Um, so well, during my repair effort, uh, Sandra made a sign and simply held it up for me to read. Uh, while I was laboring away, and it simply said, seek professional help. <laughs> mm. So we still refer to that sign, and I can tell you it is not a great morale builder for my home improvement projects. But the church seeks professional help too, even when it calls amateurs like me. Um, sometime before November 1st, I must submit my final requirements, including this sermon for review. And if the Board of Ordained Ministry and the majority of clergy vote yes, I could be ordained in June of next year as a deacon. <laughs> That's awfully nice of you. I didn't put a break in here for applause. <laughs> so what is a deacon anyway? Um, the United Methodist Church ordains deacons to ministries of word, service, justice, and compassion. I serve in community and work at the Denver Foundation, which is a community foundation serving the Denver metro area. And my responsibilities are to work with the most vulnerable in our community uh, by improving public education and economic opportunity and helping with meeting basic human needs. Um, the way it works out among those priorities, I spend a lot of my time helping folks meet basic human needs because sometimes it becomes a matter of life and death. About two years ago, with a snowstorm moving in, we came within about 48 hours of having no place in our city for about 60 homeless women to go at night. Now, these are women who are unaccompanied. They are alone. They have no family, no partners, no children with them. Many are elderly or disabled. And there are options, uh, like the Dolores Project, or the Women's Homeless Initiative, or the Gathering Place in the daytime. Uh, there's a network of churches in Capitol Hill, but at night, there are many, many more women than there are places to lay their head. Um, as an aside, each year, and I know I've seen some of you there, people gather outside City Hall on what usually works out to be a brutally cold night for a candlelight service to remember the homeless who have died in the last year. And last year, that number was 124 men, women, and children. According to the Denver coroner's office, the homeless can expect to live about 34 fewer years than the average Colorado resident. So I visited with some of the homeless women who were lucky enough to find shelter one night, and I asked them what they would have done if they didn't have a place to stay that night, if they didn't essentially win the lottery that night. Well, they said they could try to find a friendly bus driver and ride the bus all night. They didn't get kicked off the bus. They could scrape together enough for a cup of coffee, and maybe find an all-night diner and keep ordering refills and hope they weren't asked to leave. Sometimes they could uh, scrape uh, together enough money for bus fare to get out to the airport and uh, with a suitcase, an old suitcase as a prop, pretend to be catching a flight, keep moving around 
and try not to get kicked out of the terminal. But if none of these things or anything else worked, they would find themselves outside, um, maybe on a bench or in a doorway, uh, where it is now against city ordinance um, to, to try and rest. So many of these women have been assaulted because they are among the most vulnerable on the streets, on average once a week assaulted. Um, working with our community partners, we have managed to sort of nomadically find one place after another for these women to be sheltered. In fact, last winter, uh, Reverend Brad and the trustees of this church, Highland United Methodist, conferred an emergency and decided that if necessary, we would open our church as an emergency site. It turned out that the, we couldn't work out the transportation and the city found another site that night and we weren't called upon, but we were prepared to open our doors and our hearts that evening. Uh, tonight, these women will sleep on the bare concrete floor of an unused city building downtown, which has been reclaimed for city use. They're going to have to move again. And they still don't have a permanent emergency shelter. Um, we're working on it um, as soon as this week still. This morning scripture is from the book of Acts, which is the second part of a two-book series by the author of the Gospel according to Luke. Um, biblical scholars think that this author was a physician and someone who was very concerned about the poor. There are all sorts of passages that bear that out. But I'm going to read uh, from the third chapter of Acts. And I'm now at the age where I cannot see with or without my glasses. And the print is pretty tiny here, so bear with me. This is from the third chapter of Acts. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could, he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. Look at us. And he, he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. Immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So picture this. Uh, Peter and John are going up to the temple, which folks did every day at the hour of prayer. Um, you might say they were heading up to the church at the front steps at 10 o'clock in the morning. And at the gate of the temple was a poor disabled man begging for money. Now in those times, and perhaps we can relate to this today, poverty was quite a problem. Um, one biblical scholar estimates that at that time 2% of the empire controlled one-half to two-thirds of the empire's wealth. Some of the population was considered expendable. These were folks for whom the rest of society really had no use. They were compelled to beg for their survival. You could find them at the temples, especially at the temple gates where people were entering to pray. Begging was not an easy thing for folks to do because Although charity was seen as a religious obligation, dependence on charity was considered shameful. So we read, Peter looked intently at this man, as did John, and said, look at us. Which reminds me of a video campaign um, called Make Them Visible. Some of you might have seen it because it went viral. A production company secretly contacted family members and asked them to take part in a social experiment. Um, while the family members were in on the ruse, the individuals had no idea they were being set up. Their relatives and significant others dressed as homeless people, 
and then were on the street and there, the individuals walked by um, and actually saw them. But not a single participant recognized his or her mother or brother or spouse on the street. And later their loved ones revealed who they were. And when the individuals watched themselves on video walk right past their homeless loved ones, some of them broke down and cried. So Peter and John looked intently at the man and said, look at us, you matter. Peter and John insisted on making a human connection. So the man looked at Peter and John, hoping to receive something, and Peter said, I have no silver or gold, and I'm guessing the man is thinking, well, that's great. Uh, but Peter goes on to say, what I have I give you, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. Clasping of the right hand was a sign of agreement, a sign of a covenant. The man is healed in the name of Jesus. Greater even than the gift of charity is removal from the need for charity, which is all well and good, but we aren't apostles who perform miracles, so what can we do? Well, every fourth Saturday right here at this church, there are folks downstairs in the kitchen making about 100 sack lunches to provide to the homeless in Civic Center Park. We also share communion with the homeless. And one Saturday in the park, I was sitting next to Carolyn, our fearless leader of the PB&J ministry, and uh, Reverend Jerry Herships and Reverend Brad, who ordinarily would be there, had other ministry commitments that day. So Reverend Brad consecrated the elements and asked me to serve communion. And ordinarily, um, pretty shy, I just smile and say hello and I hand over a lunch or a pair of socks or a bottle of water. Um, but as I was serving communion to so many people I didn't know, it seemed appropriate I should ask people their names. And so I did. And as I uttered the, the words that those in the park have really grown quite accustomed to hearing from Reverend Jerry, what's your name? This is a reminder that God loves you. And as I looked into each person's name, eyes rather, and heard his or her name, and I repeated their name with God's blessing, I experienced something entirely new. In that moment, I felt Jesus was present in each of us, not even in a symbolic way, but actually present in that moment. We were both looking into God's eyes. We were partaking of the sacrament together. And just in case I was missing the point, as I repeated, as people filed by, this is a reminder that God loves you. One man stopped and fixed me with his gaze and said, uh, this is a reminder that God loves you. And I understood as I never had before, the ministry of the word in the world. Now we, the people of Highlands, have been asking ourselves some deep questions. Questions like, why are people poor? And what are we called to do about it as followers of Jesus? We had a Bible study series here on poverty in which we met and listened to people who had experienced hunger and homelessness firsthand. Some of you know Lynn Butler, who has uh, spoken at our worship service in the past. Lynn is the executive director of Metro Caring, which is a nonprofit organization that feeds the hungry in Denver. We've actually volunteered there as a church. She's also an ordained United Methodist minister. And Lynn said to me uh, one day, uh, you need to read this book, Toxic Charity, How Churches and Charities Hurt Those They Help and How to Reverse It. She said, this is my personal copy and I need it back. This is not her personal copy anymore. I went out and bought it instead. Uh, well, the author, Robert Lupton, who's spent 40 years working with the poor, writes that much of our mission and service work makes us feel better, but does not empower those being served. It doesn't engender healthy cross-cultural relationships. It doesn't improve local quality of life. It doesn't relieve poverty. 
He quotes the prophet Micah, God has shown you what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Mercy and justice, compassion and right relationships. Mercy, writes Robert Lupton, is the door, not the destination. It is an invitation to justice. So I had to ask myself, why did Lynn Butler single me out to read this book? Um, well, I might start with the Greek word charis, which means grace, and from which the word charity is derived. Lynn knew that I'm in the charity business. I work at a community foundation. She also knows that as a Christian, I'm about the business of grace. And as followers of Jesus, we stand in what Parker Palmer calls the tragic gap. The tragic gap is the place between the way things are and the way things ought to be. It's a heartbreaking place to live. But Parker Palmer goes on to say there are two ways the human heart breaks. A heart can shatter into shards of pain and violence, or a heart can break open to more capacity for love. A few weeks ago, I was at the Hunger Summit for Colorado, and the main speaker was a woman named Simone Campbell, who has said, Jesus is breaking open our lives. He's shown us the way. And when our lives are broken open, justice comes. Simone Campbell is known more simply as Sister Simone. Uh, for 40 years, Sister Simone and a small group of sisters have been advocating for social justice. They prayed that somehow they might spread the word and increase the number of those involved in their work. Well, four days after their prayer, the Vatican, then under Pope Benedict, censured the sisters for advancing radical feminism and working too much for the needs of people in poverty and not saying enough about issues like abortion and gay marriage. Sister Simone and her little movement became instant celebrities. Today they are known as the nuns on the bus. Uh, and be careful what you pray for, said Sister Simone. Incidentally, the nuns on the bus uh, will be in Denver next week on October 20th, up the street at Regis University. So if you Google nuns on the bus, you'll find their schedule. Click on the Colorado icon. Anyway, Sister Simone spoke about the story of the loaves and fish. And just a quick refresher if you're not familiar with the story. Big crowd of people out in the middle of nowhere, Disciples say to Jesus, it's getting late. People haven't eaten all day. They're getting crabby. Send them into town to get something to eat. And Jesus says, you feed them. And the disciples say, but we have nothing but five loaves of bread and fish, two fish. And Jesus broke the bread, and there was enough for everyone. So that's the story. I'll close this morning with a poem that Sister Simone wrote entitled Loaves and Fish. Here's her poem. I always joked that the miracles of loaves and fish was sharing. The women always knew this. But in this moment of media notoriety, I ache, tremble, almost weep at folks so hungry, malnourished. Faced with spiritual famine of epic proportions, my heart aches with their need. Apostle-like, I whine, what are we among so many? The consistent 2,000-year-old ever new response is this, blessed and broken, you are enough. I savor the blessed, cower at the broken, and pray to be enough. May we be blessed and be a blessing. Amen.